Like that'd be a very weird way to start a video. Like, or do we want to do the typical like, yeah. show show the intro screen, then it comes to this. Okay, so the point of today's video is taking the math, or I guess sort of measuring out of woodworking. Looking at it in a broad sense, we often get so obsessed with measurements and specific dimensions, but as we've progressed as woodworkers, we find more and more often that the specific measurements when building a piece aren't as important as you know relative measurements or proportion in a piece. And that when measuring is the time that you're most likely to introduce human error into your project. But the first one that I wanna talk about has to do with essentially building boxes, which is a big part of woodworking and, and several projects are gonna incorporate that. So kind of like breaking down sheet goods, the way that you should do it to do it the most accurately. Let's do that. Boom. So anytime that I'm going into a box heavy project, like my workbench or something like this bedroom built-in thing that we did a couple months back, I try to really strategize the order in which I'm gonna cut all of my panels out. Not only so that I can use my material as efficiently as possible, but also so that I can make the cuts in a way that'll set me up for my best chances of success. And the way I do that is by aiming for a strategy where I adjust my fence the least amount of times possible. And most importantly, where I'm never trying to set a single position on the fence more than one time. Because if you're gonna introduce human error, that's where you're most likely to do it. Here's an example. As you can see here, I've color-coded all of the pieces so that you can see which are identical. And it looks like there are 11 unique shapes. But what's important to note is which specific dimensions are identical and to try to do your best to make all of those finished cuts at the exact same time. So for example, all of these pieces share a dimension. And so do these pieces. And these. 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 And these. And I know that's pretty confusing to visualize, so here's another picture where I lay out each unique dimension. And it looks like if we were as efficient as possible, we'd have to set our fence a minimum of 11 times to batch out our 21 pieces. And the reason this is so crucial is because, for example, say you were to set the fence twice to cut this dimension, which is the height of all the boxes. Well, if you're slightly off, then your box is gonna be slightly out of square. And when you go to add in drawers and doors and so forth, it's just gonna make it a lot harder to get a clean result. So I've said it before, but I'll say it again. No tape measure or eye is as accurate and trustworthy as an untouched fence. Okay, this next example has to do with a question that I get asked a lot. And that is, when you're making trapezoidal boxes, how do you determine the length of the side panels and the bottom panel? And the answer is, I don't. Sort of. Because you're not a mathematician, and neither am I. And if you're not a mathematician, or if you just don't like the super technical, mathy side of this. Or if it intimidates you, right. which I think is probably what it does to a lot of people, and that's why I get questions about this type of thing. Exactly. So yeah, we, the, this, this will kind of go into us, uh, the other way of doing it without getting into all that super technical stuff. Indeed, here it is. Now, I've said exactly that before and already kind of covered this question and others surrounding these sorts of boxes in other videos. So I'm going to link to one below where I talk about the angles involved, sneaking up on the perfect fit and so forth. And in fact, in that video, I talk about not using math. So I highly recommend you check it out. It's linked and timestamped below. And here instead, I'll talk about why I don't use math. So the first option would be that I could not use math and just use SketchUp. I can reference my model and let the software tell me how long I should cut my bottom and sides. Or I could use, I guess it would be trigonometry to figure it out. But the very fact that I'm not sure if it's trigonometry or geometry alone tells me that it's probably not a good idea. But if I were to, it's basically just Sokotoa. Sine, opposite, hypotenuse, cosine, adjacent, tangent, all that good stuff. So here's the good news. Not only do you not need to know or use any of that stuff, but you shouldn't use it because you're only going to mess yourself up by using it. Hey, Chris, it's me, Sean. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but you do know I have a video specifically about using trigonometry in woodworking, right? Yeah, no, but I just wanted to show that it's not totally necessary to use that stuff if you don't want to. Plus, this video is about 
not using math and woodworking. So Okay, fair enough. But uh, can I at least put a link to that video in the description? Yeah, that's fine. But can I get back to what I was editing now? Yeah, sure, I guess. Okay, so... Both SketchUp and math give you the right answer, but it assumes that everything else you've done so far is also perfect. So that would be that these pieces are exactly three quarters of an inch thick and not say 49 64 of an inch. And this angle isn't a 10th of a degree off and you cut these exactly eight and five sixteenths of an inch long. But in reality, the chances are you're off somewhere, if not multiple places. And all of those errors are going to compound into a situation where what the actual length of the bottom panel should be isn't what the math tells you it should be. So, like I say in those other videos, cut the top to anything you want, cut the sides to any length you want, just be close and consistent between the two, and then sneak up on it to get a perfect fit. It usually takes me about four cuts going back and forth to nail it perfectly, and that takes me maybe two minutes, which, as it turns out, is faster than doing the math. For me, anyway. All right, the next sort of broad topic that we want to get into is, again, moving away from measuring and using things that you might have in your shop or that you have lying around because you're working on a particular project that you can use to set up your tools or use um, sort of as a measuring stick that's more accurate than trying to hit a specific number. So I think that'll make sense when you see the tip. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's do it. Do so it. like Chris mentioned, one of the best ways to get an accurate measurement is by not measuring at all, but instead using referential measurements. It's a simple concept that can sometimes be easily overlooked. So to illustrate the idea, I'm going to do a router inlay and measure absolutely nothing in the process. As you can see, I start this process as I would for any inlay and mark out where I'll be cutting using the actual piece. From there, I need to set my router cut depth and if you have a plunge router, this is a great little trick. First, I'll plunge the router so the router bit is just touching the surface of my material. I'll then take the actual piece I'm inlaying and set it into the plunge gauge on my router and tighten down the gauge. Often when doing an inlay, I'll back off the plunge depth by just a bit as that will ensure that my inlay is slightly proud of my material and can be planed or sanded flush. So as you can see, my router will now plunge to just under the depth of the piece I'm inlaying and I have absolutely no idea how thick the piece actually is. This next one is a trick that I actually learned from one of Sean's videos, but it's a great example because it uses a known dimension and a relative dimension to get the job done. The known dimension being an eighth inch drill bit, which matches the width of the table saw blade, and the relative dimension being the workpiece, let's call it a shelf, that you wanna fit into the dado that you're about to cut. So you just saw me do it there, but this little animation will do a better job of explaining why it works. I had started off by marking the ends of where I wanted the dado for my shelf to be. Next I position it in line with the blade on my table saw, and then clamp down a stop block with my shelf piece used as a spacer. After I make the first cut, if I were to remove the spacer and make the second cut, the dado would end up too wide by exactly the width of the saw blade. So I need a spacer that keeps it away from the stop block by exactly that width, and that's where the eighth inch drill bit comes into play. Use that as a spacer, make the second cut, and you're good. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is understanding, understanding when dimensions, dimensions aren't actually critical. All right, hang on, I got an idea. Let's try something. Okay. I'm going to say something, and you just say the next thing that pops into your head. Okay. Today's... Video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with meaning. They also empower you to accomplish your goals. They offer courses designed for real life. Yeah. <laughs> that fit into our busy lives. Also, Skillshare is very affordable when you compare it to traditional classes. And that's great. <laughs>
You know what? Actually, this doesn't seem to be working very well. So why don't we just finish this the normal way? Okay. So Skillshare has classes that cover a variety of different topics. Everything from painting to ceramics to marketing and business strategy. And with a premium membership, you get unlimited access to all the classes and communities that are perfect for you. One of the classes that I found that fell in line with what I'm doing is called DIY Filming, creating pro video from tools you already own. One of the things people often see as a barrier to start creating is the tools needed to actually create. But this class helps show that we are all capable of creating great work with what a lot of us already own. And that's a mentality I prescribe to in a lot of ways, even in my woodworking. Okay, so right now Skillshare is giving away a two month premium membership to explore your creativity. Just click on the link in the description box. All right, thanks Skillshare. Now let's get back to the video. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. Okay, so I know it might sound a little crazy saying dimensions and measurements don't matter in furniture making. After all, according to Google, a dining table is supposed to be anywhere between 28 and 30 inches tall. Actually, that's kind of my point exactly. Let me explain. When I first started building furniture, I was obsessed with accurate dimensions, especially when it came to angles. I thought that if I had designed a table leg to angle down at 10 degrees, then I wasn't successful unless that table leg angled down at exactly 10 degrees. But as I progressed in my woodworking and furniture making, I started to realize that oftentimes if the angle was 9.5 degrees or maybe 11.2 degrees, it didn't really matter. The only thing that mattered was that each leg on the table was the same. And that reminds me of something I learned in elementary school, which was accuracy versus precision. Accuracy is like trying to hit the bullseye on a dartboard or trying to nail a specific measurement or dimension, whereas precision is not necessarily hitting a specific spot, but being able to hit a spot repeatedly, like using a stop block for repeating cuts on a table saw. So for a lot of applications in my furniture, I would happily take precision over accuracy. To help illustrate this mindset, I'll use making a set of table legs as an example, and we'll do our best to keep measurements out of it. So let's say I wanna make a little end table, and I wanna do a nice set of simple splayed legs. And I know I want the legs to angle towards the ground at 10 degrees, so I set up my table saw sled and cut the angles on the ends of all of my parts. Of course, I'll do my best to hit the proper angle, but there's always some margin of error. So let's say I miss the mark by a bit and the table legs angle a little differently from what I had initially designed. As you can see, not a big deal, but what about the angle from the bottom of the leg to the floor? That's surely off now too. Well, since each leg angle might not be perfectly accurate, but they're all the same, as long as I trim all the legs to the same length and parallel to the top, any discrepancy in the leg angle will be eliminated. So long story short, dimensions are a great guideline, but knowing when they aren't absolutely critical is an important skill to have. And I know for myself, when I'm able to focus less on specific dimensions, I can focus more on building a great looking piece. So as you likely know by now, whenever I design a new project, I always start in SketchUp. And that's great. That's the quickest way for me to design and then turn that design into a reality. And like I've already mentioned early in the video, when it gets to the building phase, I do use SketchUp as a baseline reference for guides, dimensions, angles, and pretty much anything with a number involved but I don't follow it too strictly. And here's another good example of why. In these shots, you've seen me trying to determine the angle and where to cut what's gonna be a half lap for the stretchers of a base. So here's a drawing of a simple coffee table that uses the exact same joint. Now, if I were to strictly follow my SketchUp file and what it tells me the angle should be to perfectly connect to the corners, here's the angle that I would need to cut on my half laps approximately 39.4 degrees. And the very fact that even SketchUp is telling me approximately lets me know that I should take a hint and just round to something close. So technically the closest whole number would be 39. But even there, as you get into mirroring joints and cutting on opposing sides of the blade, a number like 40 is gonna be a lot easier to deal with than 39 and certainly simpler than 39.4. So we'll do that. And just to show you a side-by-side -side comparison, here's a two-dimensional drawing of the tables overlaid on one another. The difference is so small that there's no way you're ever going to see that in three dimensions and on the actual piece. And if you were to do a glass top or something where the joinery is going to be on display, I think it's just a lot easier to get a nice fitting, clean looking joint with nice even numbers, rather than ones that are as specific as an approximation of a tenth of a degree. 
So the thing that we want to leave you with is this. Yeah, we just spent like 10 minutes talking poo on measuring things in math, but that's not to say that there isn't a time and a place. Obviously, there are lots of times and places. Yeah, there's a reason why we all own multiple devices for measuring, like why I own seven tape measures. Or like me with my 8-inch woodpecker square. Or how I have this ruler. Or like my 12-inch square. Or my calipers. Or my 18-inch square. Or 26-inch square. Or my stainless steel squares. Or my T-squares. 32-inch, 24-inch, and 12-inch. Or these little guys. Right, so like we said, oh, measure- or my carpenter square. Actually, carpenter squares. Right, so like we said, measuring is important, but it's not the only way to get things right, and sometimes it might not even be the best way. 